Hey everyone, it's Andrew, the podcast editor for the show. I just want to give you two quick forewarnings about today's episode. First off, for the first six minutes and about 30 seconds, the audio for Brad and Brian are both a little, uh, how do you say it? Rough. Rough sounds good. Yeah. Um, it's just kind of glitchy, but they get it sorted out around the six minute and 30 second mark. So if you can bear with it till then, I promise you it gets better. Oh, and that is not including this little segment. So six minutes and 30 seconds after the show starts, give or take. All right, second thing, since I'm doing announcements anyway, I just thought I'd go ahead and mention that towards the end of this episode, Ed, our CEO, is going to jump in and interject a comment completely unannounced. This was due to the fact that his unbridled selfish curiosity got the better of him. He is truly sorry for the interruption. All right, that was it. Good luck, and I hope you enjoy the show. Hey, everyone. Today, we are going to be speaking with Brian Barnes, founder of M1 Finance, probably my favorite uh, investing platform, especially for my taxable brokerage accounts. It came on my radar about a year and a half ago, somewhere in that range, completely transformed my idea of what, how simple complexity could be. And the ethos behind it was so lined up with what we talk about in the FI community. I knew at some point we were going to want to have a conversation with Brian and here it is. So I'm excited to dive into his backstory, why this needed to exist, and maybe give you, if you've never taken a look at it, an inside look into why this may be the best investing platform that you may not have heard of. So with that, welcome to the Ultimate Crowdsource Personal Finance Show. This is Choose FI. You're listening to Choose FI Radio. The blueprint for financial independence lives here. If you're looking to unlock the secrets to financial independence and early retirement, you're in the right place. Stay tuned and join a community of like-minded people who are getting off the hamster wheel and taking control of their lives in the pursuit of financial independence. Choose FI, your home for financial independence online. All right, guys, excited to dive into this week's episode. Again, we're going to be speaking with uh, the founder of M1 Finance, Brian Barnes. And help me with this. I have my co-host, Brad, here with me today. How you doing, buddy? Hey, Jonathan, I am doing quite well. Yeah, I've been looking forward to this for a while. I know you personally have been talking about M1 Finance for what seems like maybe about two years now on the podcast and how just much you enjoy it and use it in your own personal life. So, yeah, this has been a long time coming. And I'm always interested in people doing innovative things and looking to solve problems. And Brian, it's a fascinating story. He started M1 Finance just a few years out of college. I mean, he was 25 years old, started a company that has turned into this. It's really, really remarkable. So Brian, with that, welcome to Choose a Vine. Thank you, thanks for having me. So, you know, we'll we'll get into actual M1 Finance as a a solution shortly here, but I want to take just a minute because I have a feeling really, if we're talking about a solution, it starts with a problem. And I believe my understanding is your investing story starts much sooner than mine, maybe as early as the age of 10. So I'd love to hear a little bit more about that. Yeah, absolutely. So I was, yeah, I was introduced to investing and personal finance at quite the young age, sort of, you know, 10, 11 years old. Parents showed me a brokerage account and said, hey, this is investing. You can place a trade. You can buy a stock. This was on Ameritrade at the time. And I think they were exposing me to it of saying, you know, if this is interesting to you, you can learn more. If it's not, you got to learn the basics. And from quite the early age, I was just massively captivated by the notion of investing. It was a qualitative problem of what is this company doing in the world? How is it going to compete? A quantitative problem of, you know, is it going to be profitable? What are the cash flows worth? And then you're making a high conviction bet behind it. And so it had stakes attached. So for me, it was just this hairy intellectual puzzle that had stakes attached and just fell in love with it. And so did it from a, a pretty early age, middle school, high school into college. And, and from an early age, just became that personal finance nerd and had, you know, sort of the fluency that people develop if they start, you know, uh, an instrument from a young age or something like that. I had that with personal finance. Brian, if I'm doing the math right, just based on your college graduation date, it sounds like maybe when you started investing at 10 years old or thereabouts, that was right around the dot-com bubble and bust, right? I, I'm curious, well, A, is my math even roughly right? And B, how did that impact your early investing? So the, the timing is right. And I think I was probably on the the tail end of the 
uh, the the bus. And so, if anything, a better time to enter the market where you know timing is it's better to be lucky than than right with timing. And I, I would say in the early stages, you know, I I don't know how sophisticated I was at 10, 11, 12. It was more of a you know something to do alongside my dad, something that's exciting, something that made me feel. Uh, probably important and you know, <laughs> the ego, but still attaching to the the company. As I, I developed, my sophistication did grow, and I, I did quite in depth fundamental research into various companies and the like. And you know, I think post bust, the 2002, 2003, 2004 was a was a great time to be buying. Prices were low. Uh, you know, you, companies were valued cheaply, and so you could buy a lot for very little and and have it appreciate and grow over time. Brian, we're always talking about second generation financial independence here. And how do you introduce the concepts of personal finance to your children? So do you recollect how your parents introduced this to you? Like where you got you know, the money to invest in individual stocks or, or what you, whatever you were doing at the time? Like talk us through like the entire system your parents set up for educating you and really walking you through like how to make these purchases. Yeah, so I think there's sort of general foundation to, you know, financial independence, financial security, and it it really does start with, you know, can you buy the basics? You know, can you buy like food, uh, clothing, shelter, and, and like, and you know, do you have enough money to cover that? And when I'm early for my parents, it was all about developing the skills so that I had the capacity to make the income to buy the basics. Once you have the basics covered, you can start, you know, thinking more broadly. You can start, you know, getting the, the nice things in life. You can. I don't know, buy art, buy, go to fun experiences, go to sporting events and whatnot. And then, you know, you, you just continue to increase your really like once more than your needs. You know, once you fulfill your, your needs, you're building uh, the once. And I think, you know, as you get and accumulate money, there becomes the question of what do you do with it? And you always have to put it in some place. And I think there was a big value of putting it in some place that can accrue value that can compound that, it, you know, you're buying ownership in something valuable that's trying to increase its value over time, as opposed to just sort of sitting in this, you know, cash earning nothing, trying to waste away with inflation. And so I think it was sort of the the mentality of always trying to progress in your general financial health and well-being to, to be able to afford what you want to afford over long periods of time. You know, Brian, what's interesting about this today, we're probably not going to get too much into qualitative analysis of various companies, not really the scope of today's episode. But what I think is of value is because at such a young age, you were able to start building a familiarity with both the companies that you were investing in, but how specifically the process that you were going through to invest in these companies, you probably noticed, uh, pain points, frustration points, but also things that seem to work really well. And I, I would imagine based on this final product that we're talking about today, that over time you probably said, man, wouldn't it be cool if I could do this, this, and this. And I'd love to hear a little bit about what some of those, you know, early epiphanies you had about the investing process as a 10 year old and then into your teens, what that actually, what was your experience as a young adult investing in a market for, you know, grownups? Yeah, for sure. So I think the, the biggest thing is there's a big goal for difference between traders and investors. And, you know, traders are trying to speculate on price, sort of, you know, make money on short-term price movements, whereas investors are trying to buy ownership over companies or asset classes or industries and really uh, like accrue the value of those asset classes or investments over long periods of time. When you take the investor mindset, you're not making that frequent of decisions. You're trying to buy something and hold it for five, 10, 15 years, maybe even longer. You know, the, the Warren Buffett, you know, his favorite holding period is forever, right? And so the, the big thing is because you're not making frequent investment decisions, it becomes much more about viewing your portfolio in totality and you know having risk exposure and the like, and a decision of what do you do when you have 500 bucks with your paycheck every two weeks. And so you know in the trading world, you have to go in and continue to remake the same decisions, buy the same securities over and over again, where the M1 world, you can make the decision once. You can say, this is what I want to own as my portfolio. These are the investments, the securities, that I want to own in the proportion I want to own them. And then it uses software to automate that process. And so it makes it very easy to every two weeks, just continually deploy money into it, have dividends get reinvested automatically. And so your portfolio is always maintained exactly how you want without having to do a ton of manual intervention. Now, this is probably an interesting point here that I'd like to explore further is the difference between kind of this M1 philosophy and day trading specifically. And I, I, I want to point out to our audience that uh, day trading 
time precision, the precision of which your money gets into the market is very important if you're a day trader. But right along with that, there's also a cost that's associated with that precision. So I'd love for you to explore, you know, for there's not a lot of day traders in our audience, but just generally, what are some of the, like, there's a lot of platforms that seem to be focused on this target demographic. And what's the downside to that approach? So I, I think the biggest downside to the approach is it's very hard to make routine justified decisions. And even if you're right once, you have to be right over and over and over again. You have to, you know, constantly time the market perfectly to, to make money. And it, if you look at, you know, the biggest companies in the, you know, in the world, an Apple, Apple will swing plus or minus, you know, a point or two each day. It'll swing, you know, massive percentage points over quarters and, and years and the like. And it, it gets to, it's incredibly hard to know what Apple is worth at a specific point in time. And it's even harder to know what it's worth at 10 a.m. versus 2 p.m. I think those are extremely random in nature. And I think people who are trying to play that game are doing it for more for financial entertainment or in a, in a gambling sense, but it's hard to make it on a true fundamental basis versus the investing mindset of, I want to own Apple over incredibly long periods of time because I think that the company will accrue value. It'll be profitable. It'll generate cash flows. It might return it via dividends or buybacks or the like. And I think those are just very different mindsets. And, and the owner's mentality just isn't contingent on what a stock does in the matter of hours, days, or the like. You're trying to accrue values over long periods of time. And so it, it's really just a, a time difference of, you know, like what is your ownership, uh, like length of time that you're going to own a specific investment. And then from a trading perspective, it's incredibly hard to predict. There are costs even when the, the commissions are free. So you're going to lose on, on the bid and ask. It's incredibly tax inefficient. So you're going to pay more in taxes. And so it's a very difficult game to play that is disadvantaged versus long-term systematic ownership. So I think it's uh, we, we take the long-term wealth building approach as opposed to short-term price uh, you know, guessing is, is maybe one way to put it. Yeah, I mean, we're certainly all about the long-term concepts here at Chooseify and really increasing the likelihood of success over an investing lifetime, 30, 40, 50 plus years. So yeah, I love that. And I, I do want to ask about how you implement that at M1. I'm actually in my account now. I'm seeing the trade window, but I do want to take just one quick step back, if you don't mind, and just touch on something Jonathan said, which is, wouldn't it be cool if dot, dot, dot. Right. And, and I guess my question to you is when you're thinking about starting this company, wouldn't it be cool if, I guess, what was the problem that you were trying to solve? What did you see as, Hey, I could invest with Vanguard, Fidelity, Schwab, or whoever, right. And what was lacking that you said, you know what, I'm going to stand up at 25 years old and I'm going to make something that I think answers this issue. Yeah. So, you know, we talked about my first exposure to a brokerage account was sort of 10, 11 years old. It was an Ameritrade account. I did the progression in Ameritrade, Options House, then Interactive Brokers as I, you know, increased in sophistication and, and wanted lower costs. And then at 25, I looked at the platforms and I said, these have not changed in 15 years. And I, and I looked around me and consumer applications were amazing in every other aspect of life. You know, they were simpler, more intuitive. They were more straightforward. They automated more of my life. I could do more with them. And the brokerage account was identical. It was a data dump of way too much information. It required me to do all the work. I had to transact in like discrete quantum of full shares. And every time I clicked a button, I got hit with a 10 buck commission, you know, and this was in a world where emails are free, text messages are free. They're all electronic messages. And so it, it was a combination of wouldn't it be great if, as well as if there's progress in every other aspect of the world, why is there not progress in financial services, personal financial management, when this is such a fundamental aspect of someone's general life? In, in terms of like the wouldn't it be nice if, it was really on the investing side, it was wouldn't it be nice if I could tell a software platform, here's the portfolio I want to own. And then anytime I had money, I could just throw it into the platform. And it just goes to work. It maintains the, the portfolio that I want to maintain. And it does it in, you know, it deploys all the money. So it uses fractional shares. So I'm not left with uh, cash and cash drag. Incredibly low fees. I don't want to get hit with the commission uh, for an electronic message. And so it, it was really, you know, how can I just make decisions 
once or infrequently and then have software sort of automate the mundane. You know, I, I don't want to have to continually go in and remake the same decision. As M1 has expanded, we've moved into other areas with, you know, borrow and spend. And it is really, you know, would it be great if I could use one financial institution as opposed to have a finance folder of 15 different apps on my phone for every different thing? Wouldn't it be nice if, you know, when I want to borrow money, I have immediate access, low cost, unlimited flexibility in the use of funds. Wouldn't it be nice if I earned interest on my cash balances and I could spend and the like? And wouldn't it be nice if I could just set up automated rules so every dollar coming into the, the platform is just automatically and intelligently directed? And so that's a lot of the first principles uh, thinking that we went in to develop the, the software and platform. I want to talk about the, uh, the, you know, I want to create a plan and then just set and forget it and have all my money deployed all the time. And it strikes me that this was really, it was a very frontier software project in that these institutions, like you said, there's been no updates for 15 years. Everything's gotten a facelift. These things, you have to do all the work. I mean, I love Vanguard. Has anybody tried to log into Vanguard this week? Forget last year, the year before. God help you. It needs to come with a user manual. And sorry, Vanguard. I like you guys. You know, I'm a huge fan. But anyways... It really, it really does. So like, you, wouldn't it be great if you got this great idea, you've got these pies, you've got these general wish lists, but then you still have these, like this requires partners. I believe you, you are actually, some of your partners are some of these institutions and you've been able to, by working with them, been able to enhance their own capabilities and take, you know, like an underlying infrastructure and just take it to an entirely new level. How did that happen? What was the connection that allowed you to pull this off? Yeah, so I think it comes a lot from our product philosophy, and, and you were hinting at it, is I think a great product lets you do complex things simply. You know, it, it's pretty easy to do simple things simply. It's pretty easy to do complex things complexly, but it, it's quite difficult to make the complex simple. And so I think our product philosophy is how can we distill it down to the bare bones of the decisions that you're making? And for you know the investment side of the uh, equation, it's what share of your total portfolio do you want in any given investment? And if you want to organize it, you can bunch it and organize it in a cohesive fashion. And that's really the extent of what we ask the customer to do. And then we focus on, hey, let's do all the the software, integrate with the old archaic systems and handle all the, the complexity, the mundane, the administrative work and the like, and use software to do it so that, you know, like a computer can do millions of calculations in a second, a human mind can't, you know, and, and so it's sort of leverage what each person or you know uh, thing is is most optimal for and so the person is you know you can make decisions over what your personal financial plan should be and then it's okay we get that we have instructions we know what to do we will Im- do all the development to to link up and integrate with the, the various outdated players to just make it seem seamless and and sort of remove that complexity from the customer's life I think one of the things that was so transformative about M1 Finance was the fractional shares of ETF. So historically, prior to being in, and maybe another company has done this, I'm sure you're more aware of this than I am, but it was the first time I had seen it done, at least as seamlessly. Prior to this, your, your options were, you can do fractional shares of mutual funds, or you can purchase ETFs, but you have to purchase one full share at a time. So you will, you know, if you have $120 and the ETF is $100, you're going to have $20 sitting on the sidelines until you can save up the other 80 to buy your next share. M1 Finance's ability to deploy all of your dollars means that you can buy $120 of an ETF that's selling for $100 a share. So fractional shares, you have one fifth of an additional share. How is that possible? And how were you all able to, you know, to pull this off with maybe an institution that hadn't been doing this before you guys came into the picture? Yeah. So, I mean, I'll I'll definitely talk about how it's possible, but I mean, you know, even if we go further back, you used to have to buy even lots. And so that's a hundred shares. And, you know, like it was a big step forward when you could buy odd lots of 65 shares. And now, you know, you could buy one share and in the commission world, that just became too expensive to do, you know, getting charged six, seven, eight, nine, ten dollars for one share was just too much of the purchase price. And so over time, there has just been a systematic decline of how much you need to invest and the costs associated with trading. And I think it's only natural to say you should be able to buy any dollar amount of any security that you want. And, you know, it's it's sort of a, if you can imagine it, it is possible. And so to the point earlier about we make the, the system easy for the user and then we do the complexity behind the scenes to support fractional shares, we're working in whole share amounts. And so, you know, if three people each want half a share, that's one and a half shares total, we will go to the 
street and buy two shares. We will give a half share to every single person, and then we will allocate half of it to our own inventory account. And so it's really just a you know sort of sub-accounting methodology, but it's all handled by computers. We don't care if the database entry in the computer says two shares or 2.75947 you know, shares. Like for us, it's indifferent. It's, it's just math behind the scenes. And so we've done a lot of work to give you the ability to buy any dollar amount of any security, which just makes it easier to deploy money consistently, have a more diversified portfolio, buy you know, stocks that are trading at $3,000 in not $3,000 chunks, but you know more systematically over time. And so we do think it's a, a huge benefit and it's only, I mean, what's weird is it's only natural that it should exist you know, because it's all computers at the end of the day. The other feature I wanted to add on to this is that you mentioned earlier how in the past you would be buying and there'd be this cost per uh, transaction, so a $10 cost per transaction. But what you just said is insanely more complex and it's more to the user's end benefit. They're saving money. They're getting money off the sidelines more efficiently, yet it costs less. And I don't mean a little less. I mean, you have a commission-free platform. How is that even possible that you could get this layer of service, this level of complexity through the lens of simplicity, but do it for free? Yeah, so you know, in the, even in the commission world, if you looked at how brokerages made money, it, it was decreasing over time, but it was you know, anywhere between 10 and 35% of the money that they made was from commissions. And so that means 65 to 90% were from revenue streams outside of commission. So all of those revenue streams still exist. And it was really our point of view, you know, companies like Robinhood that, that pushed the industry to go free, that you can operate a successful, durable business on the 65 to 90%. And the, the way that you make up for it is make it very automated and a very low cost structure. And so, you know, we, we've spent a lot in the technology development, but the additional cost to place a trade, to allocate a trade is an electronic message. It's, it's no different than an email, a text message, any electronic message that you would send. And so while it's not exactly free, it's, it's as, you know, <laughs> point zero, you know, however many, you know, zeros to, to before you get to one per transaction. And so we just sort of take a mentality that, when you're interacting in the, the electronic world, transactions are free. We can monetize the assets held on our platform in other ways to provide a amazing service to the user at no cost. Yeah, that's interesting. I was going to ask that specifically is, you know, maybe what advances or what, what do people not in your industry, like what do we not know about how companies are making money that is maybe a win-win. I think, right? Like we look at this and M1 appears free, Robinhood appears free to the user, but clearly you are for-profit businesses, right? So like, do you see it as win-win and is that universally regarded, I would say? I do think it is win-win. And if you look outside of investing, most of personal finance has either been free or they pay you to use it. So if you look at a checking account, you know, now interest rates are, are zero, but at one point they paid, you know, people to put money into the platform. And so by using a checking account, they paid you to use it. Most people will have a uh, rewards or cashback credit card. And so for every time you swipe, the company is paying you to, to use the, the product. I think investing is weirdly the last one to go free. And, you know, they're, they're I don't want to say never say never, like there is a chance that at some point companies are saying, you know, by putting your money on the platform, we will you know, share the revenue streams that we're making with you. And so I think it's easier to understand because it's been around a long time for the banking and credit card realm where, you know, a bank lends out the money that you give them and they're lending it out at three and a half, four percent And so they can afford to pay you half a percent. On the credit card, every time you swipe the uh, credit card, they're earning between two and two and a half percent of the transaction value. And so they can afford to pay you one, one and a half percent. And so on the brokerage side of the world, there are cash balances. We can do securities lending, which is lending out the shares that our users own to short sellers. There's payment for order flow. And all of these things mean that it's beneficial to M1 to have assets held on our platform and we can monetize that way. And so we don't have to charge for these transaction fees. And the way that we make up for it is being very efficient. And so I think that's the, the progress over time. And I do think it is a, a win-win for the customer where they get a amazing, compelling personal finance product and they don't have to have any cash outlay for it. Yeah, I love that. And, and I also love how it sounds like you very actively designed the platform to prevent day trading, like we were talking about before. But I, I wanted to dive a little bit more into that, the trade window. So again, I'm in my, I'm in my M1 finance account and I'm seeing upcoming trades, next trade window, is 9.30 a.m. tomorrow. Now, clearly, clearly, that dissuades day traders, right? People who are 
operating in seconds or minutes, not a day. But talk me through the thought process behind that and maybe the pros and cons for somebody like me who is a long-term thinker. Yeah, the first thing that I would say is M1 is not good for day traders. You know, if you if you do want to day trade, there are plenty of other fantastic options out there that, you know, you can buy or sell at any given time and, you know, also charge you low or no commissions. What M1 is really suited for is systematic investing in the portfolio of your choosing. And so that that is really what we've honed in on and saying, you know, you do need to make financial decisions not for tomorrow or the next day, but over the next decade several decades. And it's things, you know, building the nest egg for the down payment of the house, your kid's education, your retirement, like very big, substantial issues. And, and these are not things that you're going to make a dent in tomorrow. This is, you know, things that you need to systematically do over incredibly long periods of time to be successful. And so with the trade window approach, it, it gets back to in any given day, I think it's a random chance of what price you get. You know, if you're good enough to know that a stock is worth $10.18, at 10 a.m. and $10.23 five minutes later, like by all means do it. We don't have that capability. We don't think that that's incredibly knowable. And so it's really about you know, low cost systematic investing in the, the portfolio of your choosing. And with that, we just buy and sell twice a day. So we have a morning window where we aggregate all our orders on behalf of customers, buy the investments that they want, and we do the same thing in the afternoon. And so it allows people to any given day have a recurring deposit of, I wanna add $500 every two weeks with my paycheck. Or, you know, I want to add a thousand bucks to my IRA until it's maxed out. And with that, it's much more about the simplicity and the ease and the automation of beneficial behaviors as opposed to going in and forcing you to sort of play the market. Hey, Brian, you've mentioned every two weeks a couple of times. Is that a frequency that you recommend? Is that like the most often used on M1? Is it just sheer happenstance that you've mentioned a couple of times? Uh, like talk me through how often can you put money in if you wanted to do a recurring yeah. uh, deposit? So, I mean, if you want to, the M1 system is very flexible and you could do it every day if you want. The reason that I say every two weeks is the most common use case in America is they get paid every two weeks or twice a month. And so, you know, if people are establishing good financial habits, they're probably saving 10, 15, 20% of their income every two weeks. And so they just have extra cash. And it, there, there's a question of what do you do with that extra cash? And what M1 allows you to do is set the beneficial behavior by default. And so, you know, the money automatically goes into your investments. You don't have to think about it as opposed to every two weeks or twice a month having to make decisions over and over again. And it's just in you know any good habit that you want to do, the more that you can automate, the better you're going to adhere to it, as opposed to every single time it comes up, you have to make active choices. Hey, everyone, we're going to get right back to the show to hear Brian Barnes talk about some of the core features of N1 Finance right after these quick messages. I think one of the features that M1 Finance has that's really a core feature and makes it stand apart from really anything else we've seen is this idea of the pie. And since we haven't really defined it for our listener right now, and they may not have checked out the platform yet, I'd love to give you a chance to talk about why a pie and why a pie is hiding a significant level of complexity inside a pretty simple structure. Yeah. So the, the pie is how M1 orients around portfolio management rather than trading. And so in M1, you're not placing, you know, a trade type of a certain amount of shares for a certain security and clicking a button and having it go through automatically. You're building the portfolio that you want to maintain at any given time. And we do that through this notion, the pie. So we call it a pie because it's a pie chart, you know, a pretty creative <laughs> branding there. And it's really the, the highest level of that pie is 100% of your investment portfolio. And then you can start slicing and dicing it into slices. And you can say, at any given time, I want 5% of my money in this investment. I want 15% of my money in that investment. And so it's carving it up on a, at any given time, I want this share of my money in this investment. And the nice thing you can do is you can also organize it where you can sort of do these like nested pies. So you can say, at any given time, I want 25% of my money in healthcare stocks. And that can become its own pie where you can you know, carve up to seven different healthcare stocks that you want to own. The nice thing there is it allows you to build a very diversified portfolio of the investments you want. It's controlling risk exposure. And so you, you don't get over-concentrated in anything and you're really allocating how much of your you know, investments you want. It forces decisions of, you know, I don't want more than 20% in any given individual security. I, I want to be properly diversified. And then the ongoing methodology of how it works is anytime money comes in or out of the platform, it tries to move the money and the investments 
to that target allocation. And so if you have an investment that you want to be 10% of your portfolio, your initial investment, exactly 10% of your initial investment will go into that security. If over time, that slice has performed incredibly well and it now represents 20% of your portfolio, it's overweight. And so as you contribute money, money will not go into that slice. It will go into underweight slice to bring them up to the proper proportions. And in that methodology, it almost forces an, a buy low, sell high mentality of as things become higher proportions of your portfolio, you buy less of it. So you don't continue to the overexposure. As things become less, it's because it's gone down on a relative basis, you're systematically buying more. And so it, it, it's a really intuitive way to construct a portfolio. And then the, it makes the ongoing management just automate the beneficial behaviors of portfolio management. And it does it in a very tax efficient way. I think the nested pie or the pie inside of a pie approach is just beyond amazing when people really appreciate what we're talking about. I'll give a couple scenarios and maybe you can add a couple more. But if we think about risk tolerance as being a timeline, time to needing the money, not so much an age, your whole pie is 100% of your portfolio. You could have two subcategories of one for equities and one for bonds. Alternatively, you could have, hey, I've got my kid's college fund. I want to buy a house in five years. I want to have a retirement fund. And these, each one of these pies inside of your whole portfolio pie may have different timelines attached to them. So one may be more risk averse, i.e. I need this money in five years. Inside of that pie, you could then have, well, this is my ratio of stocks to bonds, et cetera, et cetera. And then you can, I mean, just unbelievable level. And then what we're talking about here is you, now for some people, and again, this works for people that want to have a simple portfolio. It works for people that want to hold hundreds and hundreds of companies and funds you're talking about a scenario where you're adding your next $500 on a two week basis, and you could be making several hundred small transactions, but doing it commission free. That's incredible. And all you're doing is just, you're, you're setting, you're figuring out what you want. You're figuring out what your goals are. And then you're making this, you know, $500 deposit that then is being executed along 200, 300 different paths to keep these pies totally in balance. Are there any other scenarios that you see that are popular that weren't covered by that? Just, uh, what I grabbed for just now. Yeah. So, I mean, the, the system is incredibly flexible and we, we liken it to, you know, the folder architecture on your computer where you can have folders and within any folder you can have specific files or you can have additional folders and it allows you to really organize it as you see fit. And people organize it on time horizon, risk, asset class, industry. And, and you know, we have pre-made pies that, you know, if you're unsure of where to invest M1, serves up sort of robo-advisor-esque allocations. We have a lot of people who say, I want 90% of my money managed for me in a M1 moderately aggressive portfolio that is modern portfolio theory, you know, asset classes across the seven, eight asset classes, all low-cost ETFs. But then they can say, I want the final 10% to be in stocks I follow, like, enjoy. And it's, uh, I'm not going to make or break my financial plan, but I enjoy it a lot more. And so, you know, we, we have a lot of people who do many different things with it. The platform is extensible to what you want to do. Some people add probably more complexity than they need, but it can be as simple or as complex and as customized as you want, which is a very flexible platform. And then, like you said, it's no cost. So you can, the, the general premise is you can systematically invest in the exact investments you want in exact proportion to what you want for free. That's really, really cool, Brian. And I, I love this concept. I think your quote from maybe 10 or 15 minutes ago, do complex things simply. That's something that I suspect we're going to use here at Choose a Vive for, for years to come. That's what we're talking about, right? Like this is in theory complex, but when you get it down to its essence, it's very clear. And I think one of these that bedevils people is rebalancing, right? So that's in essence what you're talking about here with every little bit of new money that comes in, you set up these targets. Sometimes you get overweighted, sometimes you're underweighted based on performance. But when this new money comes in, it sounds like your platform automatically rebalances. So I guess, A, just confirm my understanding of that. And then B, is there another way to rebalance? Let's say you aren't actively putting in new money. Like, is there is there a way that M1 allows you to rebalance? Because again, I think rebalancing is one of those things that people talk about a lot. And I know very few people that actually rebalance their portfolios. You want me to take money out of my winners and put it in my losers? What? Yeah, what are you, crazy? <laughs> <laughs> so the, the typical notion of in rebalancing is to control risk exposure. So you're, you know, if you have a typical, I don't know, 60, 40 stock bonds portfolio, 
over incredibly long periods of time, your stocks are probably going to outperform your bonds. And so it'll be 70, 80, 90% of your portfolio. And you want to reduce the risk of you know, having your portfolio concentrated in the stock volatility and move it to the bond volatility. And so the typical notion is you sell the things that are overweight and you buy the things that are underweight to bring it back to the proportion that you intend from a, a risk standpoint. The problem, like you can do that on the M1 platform. So it's a one-click button. You just click rebalance, next trading window. It sells the overweight, buys the underweight, brings you back into per per perfect proportion. The problem with that is it's relatively tax inefficient that anytime you sell securities, you're going to have to pay either short-term or long-term capital gains on the gains that you've made of that sale. And so ideally, you want to defer selling things for as long as possible. And so that's what M1 does, where we allocate money towards underweight slices, and we call that dynamic rebalancing. And so it's anytime there's cash in the platform, how can we intelligently direct it towards rebalancing your portfolio without causing any sales or taxable events? And so you know, if you set up that biweekly, every two weeks, twice a month deposit, your portfolio is going to remain in the proportion that you set up because it's always going to be systematically buying the underweight, and you never have to go through that manual rebalance, which causes negative tax consequences. I'm glad you brought up tax efficiency. And I, and I love that as well, that we're talking about a very tax efficient version of rebalancing without you actually ever having to make that very painful decision to rebalance. It's just done for you. So to Brad's point, people never actually rebalance. Well, with M1 Finance, you don't really have to, and you're getting the same level of risk protection. So that's a great point. But I actually did want to come back to tax efficiency because I believe M1 Finance does have some rules in place that might not be visible at the highest level. You might not see it right away, but they have some rules in place to minimize your tax exposure. Uh, and I'd love for you to kind of break down the hierarchy of what M1 Finance does to minimize your tax exposure when you're utilizing the platform. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, people, I think, focus on the commissions or management fees. In the grand scheme, I think taxes are going to be your biggest expense in investing. And so I think if you want to maximize your long-term success with investments, minimizing your taxes is, is really controlling your costs. And so, you know, the, the first thing you can do, put your money in an IRA. So either a traditional or a Roth. And so M1 offers both of those accounts. And you can know that they're good because the government limits how much you can put in them. You know, if, if they cap how much you can put in them, like it's probably an indication that you should go up to the cap if you have the ability to do so. And then from a, we talked about the dynamic rebalancing, which minimizes the sales of securities, which have uh, tax consequences. And then finally, when you we do sell any security, we're going to go on a lot by lot basis for the individual securities that you own and try to sell the lots that have the lowest tax consequence. So first, we're going to sell anything that is a loss. And so that allows you to offset future gains and you can carry it forward in your tax year. Then we're going to sell long-term gains. And so that comes typically with a tax advantage preferred rate of long-term capital gains is lower than short-term, which is your ordinary income rate. And then only after those are exhausted, do we sell from a short-term basis. And so every single thing that we're doing is we're trying to push taxes out as far as possible so that the money remains in your account and has further time to compound. And so it's almost a interest-free loan from the government of you have more money in your account to accrue value and you can minimize taxes for as long as possible. So I know Brad, the accountant over here often uses the term, don't let the tax tail wag the dog. And one way that people really fall into this trap is with tax loss harvesting, which has a lot of appeal for, for many investors. And the reason I bring this up is to kind of do a little bit of a battle test, but to get, you know, the founder's perspective on this, some companies actually kind of lead with this and I'll, I'll use Betterment as an example. This is one of the kind of their big marketing pushes that tax loss harvesting is a built in feature for their platform. It's not one that M1 advertises in the same way. And I'm curious your perspective on how these smart rules compare to that and how you think this kind of stacks up. Yeah, so I, I would say tax loss harvesting is absolutely a beneficial feature. And so, you know, no, no hiding away from it does serve value to the end user. I think there's two things that make it difficult for M1 to do it. The, the first is people can own a lot more securities in M1 than they can in Betterment. You know, Betterment, it's six to 10 ETFs. And the way that they do tax loss harvesting is if one of the ETFs go down, they buy a similar but different ETF. And so it's very easy to find a comparable, you know, Vanguard S&P 500 ETF and an iShares S&P 500 ETF, and they swap them out. There is a little bit of ambiguity of whether the IRS views those as identical or not, but, you know, we'll, we'll put that aside. And so it, it is easier for Betterment to do because there are 
quite similar, if not substantially identical securities to, to place that in. In the M1 world, you can own individual securities. And so if you own Apple and Apple goes down, there is a question of, do you want us to sell it and buy Microsoft? Are those substantially identical companies for you? Do they have similar risk profiles? Or are you investing in them for the specific nature of the underlying security? And so we don't want to make that decision for our users. We want our users to make that decision for themselves. The second is just in the weird complexity of regulations where the robo-advisors are advisors, and so they can make investment decisions within your account. M1 is a self-directed platform. And so what we do is we build a tool to empower you to make the decisions you want to make in your portfolio. And due to that, we actually can't make decisions on your behalf. We can't you know, say, hey, you asked us to buy this security. We decided we wanted to, you know, because it went down, we want to swap that out over time. And so, you know, there, there's a little bit of complexity there of what we're allowed to do. I would say over time, M1 will build out more robust tools to inform the user of tax consequences, how they can take advantage of it, and in some sense, automate according to their plan. That, that's the reason where there's additional complexity as well as uh, some compliance issues from supporting a feature like that. The one thing I would say is the value of tax loss harvesting has been massively overstated. And if you look at you know what the, the robo-advisors claimed four, five, six years ago to the value, they've removed all those references because I think they got a little bit of a hand slap um, due to, to sort of over-promising the, the value of tax loss harvesting. Generally speaking, your individual investments, your asset class exposure, and minimizing taxable events is going to have the most dramatic effect. Tax loss harvesting is, is an additional thing to add, but it's, you know, like you said, it shouldn't be the, the dog that wags the tail. Brian, I actually got an email from one of our listeners a couple of weeks ago, and I should have pulled it up before, but I'll paraphrase. So basically, it was this woman was asking, hey, Jonathan is always talking about M1 Finance. I'm curious, like, why would I use M1 as opposed to Vanguard? Is there, are there huge pluses and minuses? Like, I guess, what would be your kind of succinct answer to that? And I mean, we love Vanguard, obviously. So, you know, I don't expect you to uh, to rag on Vanguard by any means, but like, it seems like people can invest in Vanguard ETFs very easily at, at M1. What would be your response to that question? Yeah, so, I mean, we're incredibly supportive of Vanguard. I think the ethos for their prioritization of the individual investor is an ethos that we carry at M1. And even the template portfolios that we provide are almost always entirely Vanguard ETFs. And so, you know, we're, we're quite supportive of Vanguard. I would say at Vanguard, you can buy the Vanguard ETFs, mutual funds, and then they have a like a pretty mediocre brokerage to, to buy other securities. But it's it's not the most intuitive. It's not the best design. And what I would say is, M1 allows you to do everything that you can do at Vanguard plus more. And so, you know, I think that's that's the benefit. You can absolutely buy the Vanguard ETFs. You can set up a proportion. So the, the simplest portfolio, you can say, I want 80% in a Vanguard total stock index, 20% in a Vanguard total bond index, and be done with it. We also offer a more robust, comprehensive personal finance platform where we offer a line of credit against your investment portfolio. So you can always be systematically investing. But if you ever need liquidity, you can tap into that portfolio at rates as low as 2%. So you don't pay for it unless you use it. So it's always there, completely flexible. You only pay for what you use. But if you need liquidity, you can you know, tap into your portfolio's value without having sales and the taxable consequences associated with that. We also have an integrated high-yield checking account. And so you know people can use a checking account, earn 1% on their cash, 1% cash back through an M1 debit card, and you can set up automated rules. So you can say, anytime my paycheck comes in, I want to direct money towards my IRA first. When that's maxed out, spill over to my taxable account. And so it's, it's just a much more robust platform where it also doesn't limit you from owning the exact same investments you can at Vanguard. Cool. Hey, you just piqued my curiosity. So when your paycheck comes in, Talk me through that. Like, do you have an ability to set up your checking account, I guess, at M1 or connected to, and then M1 is aware, or, or am I misinterpreting what you were just saying? No. So we, we do have a checking account. It's provided by our partner bank, Lincoln Savings Bank out of Iowa. So it's an FDIC insured checking account. It's M1's interface. And so, you know, it's the same design and usability and ease and simplicity that you'd come to expect with the investing platform. You have an account and routing number, so you can you know, set up direct deposit uh, to flow into the M1 account. And when it's on our system, we can do a lot of things because we know the balance is everywhere. So you can say, you know, I never want to go but 
above $10,000 in cash in my checking account. It's just too much. I don't need that for you know day-to-day, month-to-month purchases. And so anytime I go above that, just move the excess into my investments. Um, and you know you can set it up to first my IRA, then my taxable account, or you can set, you know, anytime I have excess cash, I want to pay off my borrow balance. And so it allows you to set up a lot of rules anytime there's excess cash. And you can also do the inverse. And so, you know, if your cash balance dips below $1,500, you can say, hey, I want to bring that balance back up. I can either do it from my borrow pool and, you know, take it down at 2% interest, or I can sell off some securities and move that cash over. So it's a very flexible platform where you can have your money's always invested how you want, but you have access to liquidity anytime you need to make a purchase. So you're talking about smart transfer rules. It's a relatively new feature that just got rolled out, I believe. And and honestly, I'm learning more about it even now. Ed has been testing it behind the scenes pretty significantly and has gotten very excited about really keeping all of your cash interested. And actually, Brad, even as I'm saying this, I'm thinking for someone like you, Brad, the anti-budgeter that doesn't want to think about their money all the time, but wants to have a couple rules in place, doesn't want to have cash idle. Like you don't budget, you just keep two months of cash and everything beyond that you invest. It's even taking some of that decision-making framework off the table. When you combine that with the instant liquidity that you have between borrow, it allows you a little hedge there. If you decide that, you know, you want to take something right now, but you're not really ready to make the sell decision yet. You're able to get all of that at that and I believe that there there's some other features we're going to get into, but as low as 2%, really, I mean, it's, this thing is becoming a monster machine. The, the two things that I keep waiting for, because the way you guys are building this, it really could be the all in one vehicle with, with really one massive thing. And then another one that's kind of like a, wouldn't it be cool if on my list? And that is right now there's no 401k. There's no 401k exposure. I'm sure that's a big hurdle that I'm sure you guys are thinking about or looking at. I'm sure it's massive. And then the other one is the UTMA. How could I get my kids investing sooner? I'd love to give you a minute just to explore both of those topics because I'm sure it's not the first time you've had that conversation. Yeah, so, uh, you know, first, first I'll comment, we do call ourselves the finance super app. And so we, we want to be a personal finance platform and we think it's impossible to manage your finances without thinking of them holistically. You can't optimize your investments and be great. You have to think about how you're spending and borrowing money. You can't optimize how you spend money and not think about you know where your investments are or, or how you're borrowing. And so we do try to couple everything together. And generally speaking, we have a philosophy of you should have all the liquidity that you want. You should have informed information about how your money is being handled. All of your excess money should be invested in the investments you want in exact proportion to what you want for as low of cost as possible. In M1's case, it's free. And if you ever need to borrow money, you should be able to borrow. The finance firm should work to give you money on the most flexible terms and lowest costs. And so that is our sort of underlying principle. And we are going to you know, continue to go down each of those paths. On the 401k, it is a regulatory burden. I'm not, yeah, I, I wish I had a better uh, answer than that, but it's absolutely on our radar. We actually did just launch custodial accounts. And so uh, that is available. Um, it, you do have to be an M1 plus member, which is our sort of Amazon Prime-esque membership, where it's $125 a year uh, and you get benefits across invest, borrow, and spend. We are currently offering a promotion where M1 Plus is available to users for free for one year. And so, you know, people can sign up, they can create a custodial account, they can add things for their kids and, and be able to save for, you know, college and, and their well-being in a very tax-efficient manner. By the way, I should tell people I paid for that, the, the full 125 <laughs> and I renewed. So just if it's free, that's amazing. But I actually did pay for that. And I didn't know you had to roll out those custodials. So that's amazing. So I can now get my kids set up because I was trying to think I was going to have to come up with some sort of jury rig way of doing it. That's amazing. Uh, yeah. So I think our soft launch was a few days ago and then it, it officially launches we're, we're going to advertise it and the like in the uh, first week of February. Congrats. That's awesome. So I'll just add, I'm just going to interject a little bit. Hey, Brian. So like uh, in the last uh, four weeks, I've been busy migrating all my portfolios from Merrill Edge, Betterman, Robinhood, and Ally to M1. And the only reason I held on to Vanguard is because of the, uh, my kids are uh, custodial you know, <laughs> of <laughs> IRA we'll, accounts. We'll our, uh, so <laughs> I guess I'm I'm uh, leaving um, um, Vanguard too. So when are you guys going to do HSAs? <laughs> um, this interview just got real soon. people. I'll, I'll this, start, this just turned from yeah. like, like getting information to like advocacy for the fight community. <laughs> for sure. <laughs> <laughs> so we will be moving into more banking products and the HSA is like goes through a bank. And so we will be bringing that out as sort of in tandem, but it, it's probably a year or more before we're able to support HSAs. 
So Brian, obviously you're dropping some bombs here and this, this is huge. And I'm actually watching Brad's facial expressions as you're saying this, because I've advocated for M1 finance for a very long time, very intensely. And I think a lot of people in the community have at least given it, checked it out. And we've gotten a lot of positive feedback that Brad sees trickle through, through his emails to the degree that Brad set up an account, but you know, Brad's like, I got my simple system. It works for me. I'm just going to do it has really probably kept him from like going all in. And as I'm watching this interview, I'm watching his facial expressions and I'm seeing this is a guy that now feels like he's missing out. And, uh, I'm just curious, Brad, if that's true and, uh, what your thoughts are, what questions are prompted by this discussion. Yeah. I mean, I'm certainly impressed. Like, like you said, I have had some money with M1. I mean, it's a fairly small amount, but for a couple of years and, and in fairness, I just didn't log in often enough, even though Jonathan, you told me numerous times that I, I should. So yeah, I mean, I, I thought the slices were really cool. I liked the, uh, kind of auto rebalancing, but I was definitely unaware of a lot of the additional features. So yeah, I mean, definitely intrigued to learn more. And, and actually as part of that, Jonathan, I'd love for you, I know when when we were talking about having HELOCs and or emergency funds, right? Like different ways to have type of emergency funds. You were talking about the liquidity options that like you consider through M1. So I'd love for A, you to rehash that and then to get Brian's kind of feedback on on just the way that you conceptualize that. Yeah. So M1 has kind of slowly brought me much like the way this conversation is happening. M1 has kind of slowly introduced the features and they keep doing such a good job that I kind of keep trusting them a little bit more and more and end up using and all of, and the, and you find that the more features they add, the more they're kind of tied together. I'm going to talk specifically about borrow in a second here, because that was one of them that I was like, oh my goodness, how did I live without this? The one I wanted to mention though, for users real quick, cause we glossed over it was with these smart transfer rules that Brian just mentioned, actually imagine that now in the context of withdrawal. Like you have all of your wealth there and we're talking about big earn, how just treat it like a paycheck. You're just giving yourself a paycheck instead of doing this massive drawdown at any particular point in time, you just pay yourself. How cool would it be to be able to just pay yourself when it comes to decumulation, but to do so in a guaranteed tax efficient way using rules that are already pre-based just on a regular paycheck basis. So I just didn't want to gloss by that. Cause I think these smart transfer rules as they get more sophisticated and as you can actually share rules, imagining someone putting together like a list of the rules that they use that they find you can actually templatize decumulation for, you know, specific goals. That's the level that we're talking about. Decumulation can actually be as simple as accumulation. And that statement has never been true before. Just pause on that and realize that's the most massive thing that we're not saying enough about right now. So now going back to borrow, I always thought when I got a house, I was going to get a HELOC. You know, it was like one of those things I was going to get a HELOC. And by the time that I got to the point where I was ready to apply for the HELOC, I started stumbling onto M1's borrow and specifically M1 borrow it, it, at first look, you're just like, well, it's a margin loan. Margin loans are scary, you know, because you could have a, a margin call. And, but then as I thought about it more and I realized what was actually in place, I realized if I'm using this from a mindset perspective, I'm using this the same way that a person would use a HELOC. The, the risk that would be associated with, you know, taking a margin loan and then reinvesting it in the market. And then, you know, which is a bet that can work for you or against you is totally different. This has now become a liquidity tool and one that I am able to have much more control over. And so M1 allows you to get the money instantly. So it actually gives you an incentive to save more, Brian, I'll let you get the specifics, but let's just say generically, you can borrow up to 30% of the money that you have invested. It might be more than that. It's somewhere in that range. So if you have a hundred thousand dollars and you effectively, even though all hundred thousand are invested, you have access to a liquid $30,000 emergency fund. Would you like a 60,000 or 80,000 or a hundred thousand dollar emergency fund? That's also always working for you. Great. Let's get 200, $300,000 invested. Our goal to get a bigger emergency fund is just to invest more. The best emergency fund is one that never has to be used. Most of us never have to use it. But in the old model, by the time that you finish this, you know, Ramsey-esque six-month emergency, fully funded emergency fund, like you never have gotten started investing. You've never gotten to the process where your money is actually earning money for you. And this flips that and gives you an incentive to build an emergency fund, but do it by saving a crap ton of money and investing it. And so, Brian, you can probably add more details to that. But that was when I realized that I was like, yeah, I'm not doing a HELOC. I'm just going to double down and save more <laughs> on, my, on the platform. No, you're exactly correct. And I, I think, broadly speaking, people fall into the camp of they have too much debt or not enough debt. And I think that there is actually a optimum amount of debt that people should hold. People borrow for a lot of different reasons, whether it's college education, car, homes, all very valuable reasons that you can't afford. 
that it's just better to have you know the bank providing the capital and you can pay for it over time. And so, you know, I think there's a like we we never advocate taking on too much debt, but when you do take on debt, I do think it should be viewed somewhat universally. And the the things that matter are what can you use it for and what is the interest rate. And I think you should always optimize for most flexible use terms. Use it for whatever you want, whether it's a car, a kitchen remodel, a vacation. You can do it for you know a, a home or student loans, whatever it may be. And then you just want your interest rate as low as possible. You know, like lower is always better. And if you take the analogy of a HELOC, the bank that is providing the HELOC is backing it up against the home. And so if they are ever at risk of losing money, they go through the very unfortunate process of foreclosing on your home, selling an illiquid asset. If you think of it in that context, we are collateralizing it against a liquid portfolio that we know what is worth on a second by second basis. And we do have the capacity to sell at any given time. And so when you take that mindset, that should be the lowest cost capital that you can ever get. It's against a liquid investment portfolio that we know what it's worth on a, a second by second basis, as opposed to a home, which is a like fixed asset that is pretty illiquid in terms of selling it. And so I think it's every single person should have this available to them. You know, if you've built up a portfolio, you should have a line of credit based on that portfolio at really low interest rates. The nice thing about M1 is it's there by default. Like if you don't use it, you don't pay for a penny, but it's there. And there's just value in it being there. And we're always going to work to provide you the lowest cost, most flexible terms. And over time, we will move into, you know, we collateralize first against your most liquid asset. Then we offer mortgages and HELOCs. Then we offer unsecured. And people should be able to sort of like tap into the sort of credit facilities or loan facilities that are available to them. But it should be on the finance firm to make that easy and accessible and low cost for the end user. So Brian, the finance super app, that's a very cool little phrase and and a big deal, right? Like what is the future? So obviously you've built in a ton of features since you started. Where do you see this going? I'm sure there are some things you can and cannot talk about, but but what's your what's your ideal goal 20 years from now for M1 Finance? Yeah, so we, we, we talk about it, the finance super app, and we do say it's a platform. And so you come to M1 to manage your finances or your money, not just a component of your money. So the the more that you use M1, the more products that you use, they integrate incredibly well and they enhance one another. So, you know, the, the invest borrow one that we just talked about is the great example of if you invest for free, you can borrow for cheaper. And so by using both products, you're you know, it's beneficial to use the M1 platform as opposed to put together two point solutions. We think a lot about what does someone with you know fifty million dollars get if they work with a you know ultra high net worth advisor, and they would have a relationship person and a team in the background optimizing every aspect of their finances. We want to have that level of capability, but offer it to the person with fifty thousand dollars and offer it in a self serve product in the palm of their hand. So I think we will you know be a broad product where you can do anything that you want with your finances, whether it's invest, borrow, spend. Uh, I think those will always be our pillars because it's your balance sheet and your cash flows. We will add additional information for making informed decisions across each, better options available, and then automating as much as possible. So we, you know, anytime a dollar comes into the M1 platform, there should be a preset rule of where can this be best used? And it just happens by default. You don't have to go in and do it yourself. So I think that that's the, the future is personalized financial automation on a very large scale. I think one thing that uh, we should talk about real quick, just as we kind of start to come to the end of this, this feature list is translation for people. And the one big thing is if they've listened to the show for any period of time, they've heard us talk about total stock market index funds, and they've heard us use the term VTSAX. And I just know for a fact that there are people, they're going to go to M1 and they're going to search for VTSAX and they're going to be like, well, I can't get VTSAX on this platform. So, you know, oh, <laughs> crap. And I'll just go ahead and I'll, I'll spoil this for everybody real quick. When we talk about VTSAX is a mutual fund. M1 Finance does not have mutual funds. They have ETFs. And there is a identical, and I don't mean similar, I mean identical ETF version of the mutual fund VTSAX, and it's called VTI. So when you see VTI, which is available on the M1 platform, that is an ETF version of the mutual fund VTSAX. I also wanted to point out for people that VTI specifically, because it's similar to something that JL Collins talks about in his book, The Simple Path to Wealth. If you are looking for a more complex version, like Paul Merriman's ultimate buy and hold portfolio, which he talks about in his, on his uh, website, 
There are Paul Merriman pies, the ultimate buy and hold portfolio pies are another one. And, and, and Brian mentioned uh, modern portfolio theory. I mean, these, these are things where if you have someone who's uh, investing ethos you identify with, you can quite literally go on there, set up your hundred percent pie, and then you could nest another pie that says I'd like for 80% or 90% of what I'm doing to match up one-to-one to -one to what one of these individuals has set up. And then you could easily set up another pie that says, this is my experimental money where I, you know, do qualitative analysis on various companies. The other thing that I want to talk about, and this was uh, a bigger deal a couple of years ago than it is now. It appears that several platforms have gotten competitive on this, but it is the the price of entry, it used to be that you would need $10,000 to get started with VTS, CX, and I think they bumped it down to $3,000. Um, I want, I would like to give you the floor, Brian, to talk about, you talked about how you, we shouldn't just have these tools available for multi multi-millionaires. Someone with $50,000 should be able to get similar levels of service. Like what is the minimum amount that someone would need to get started with M1 finance? And what are the characteristics of someone that's really going to succeed with this platform? Yeah, for sure. So, the, you know, I think the big thing with financial habits is think holistically. You know, it's it's impossible to optimize one aspect of your finances and succeed holistically. You need to think about your skills and how much you're making money, your budgeting so that you're saving a little bit each time, what you do with your savings and investing that in a diversified portfolio at low cost of investments that you know and understand. If you borrow money, doing it at, at low cost. And I do think it is automating as much as possible so that you don't have to continually remake good decisions. Good decisions just happen by default. And so, you know, that that's true in any habit of, you know, you want the good thing to happen without thinking about it. And that's what M1 provides. I said it earlier, but I just think it is so massive that I suspect we'll be coming back to it again and again. But I'd love your thoughts on this. This person, this retiree that's now in decumulation, that's now able to use smart transfer rules. So they're starting to bring money out of their 401k and they're bringing it into M1 or maybe M1 at this point is, has, you know, a way to participate in the 401k plans, but either way they're in decumulation and they are looking for a way to create their own paycheck following a tax efficient rules-based approach. The software that you've already put in place, is that ready for that? Absolutely. So, I mean, we have IRAs, we have taxable accounts. And so people can transfer 401ks into IRAs through a rollover process. And then, yeah, you can set up smart accounts. And so, you know, uh, uh, the retiree could say, I'm using M1 as my primary checking account. I'm earning a 1% cash balance on that, which I can't get anywhere else. And anytime it dips below $5,000, I don't have enough cash. And so I need to add to it to, to pay the bills. And so bring me up to $15,000. And M1 will automatically sell from the right portfolio. We will do it in the dynamic rebalancing fashion. And then when we do sell things, we'll do it in that tax efficient manner that we we discussed earlier. And it'll bring you up to 15,000 and the person can just go about spending and, and using their money uh, as they see fit. And so, you know, it doesn't have to be hyper prescriptive of, I need this amount of money every you know week or month or, or the like. It can really be dynamic of, if I don't have enough cash to pay for my ongoing bills, fill me up. You know, I don't know if for me, it'll be a traditional retirement age or an early retirement age, but I suspect I'll be using these smart rules to handle my decumulation uh, drawdown. So very, very cool. Brian, you've been very generous with your time and we went a lot deeper than I think probably any of us suspected when we started this call. Thank you so much for joining us on the podcast today. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. All right, everyone. Well, I hope you understand why you hear me talk about this all the time. I, I am blown away by what they're creating. I cannot believe that Brian w was not, he didn't, he didn't learn all this through the lens of financial independence and then go out and create this exact product. Instead, I think it's just the perfect convergence. Um, and every new tool and feature they build just gets me more excited about it. So again, if you want more information, you want to follow up on this, check it out. Just go to chooseFI.com slash M1. That's the letter M1. And as Brian mentioned on this show, they are extending their promotion right now. So that M1 plus feature, which actually gives you a second trading window. So you get a morning and an afternoon trading window, plus a lower interest rate on that liquidity that we mentioned. Uh, you get that membership, that plus membership for one year for free. It's $125 value. I paid for it. So go ahead and get it for free. If you decide to check it out, go to chooseify.com slash M1. All right, my friends, the fire is spreading. We'll see you next time as we continue to go down the road less traveled. 
If this episode was helpful to you, don't forget to subscribe. If you want to help spread the word, please give us a five-star review and tell your friends about us. We can be found on Apple, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and anywhere you listen to podcasts. While you're there, don't forget to check out our other shows like Everyday Courage with Jillian Johnsrud and Rebel Entrepreneur with Alan Dalmigan. If you would like a free bite-sized course to jumpstart your financial independence, check out chooseify.com slash challenge. Chooseify is produced by Andrew Mendonca and Zachary Tan and is a production of Chooseify Media Incorporated. Chooseify.com is managed by Annie Sheely with William McVeigh, M.K. Williams, Melissa Lagerquist, Liz Kessler, Stephen Hettig, Kelly Black, and Jennifer Ma. And Ed T. is our CEO. Thanks for listening.